things that uh, people are arguing about in, in a heightened way uh, in this moment. And uh, I, I wanted to just, as a kind of a, with, a, with the heart of a pastor, just sort of come to us, a guy who, you know, is really happy when the sheep are all in one, one kind of place. Uh, I, I really want to just, just say some things about unity in the next several weeks that can maybe help draw us together and help bring us together and help protect us um, from what some of the other churches that, that we know are experiencing and, and help us grow deeper in unity. We certainly need to grow deeper as well. So I'm just going to start by reading um, from Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to start with uh, actually Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, and read through to 4, 6, and then we'll talk about it. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we, th- we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. Amen. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Uh, A.W. Tozer, in his book, um, a really famous book, I, it's, it's an old book, but I just encourage you to just get it and maybe find it, find the audio book, whatever it is, and just read it. It's just a book on the basics of knowing God and pursuing Him and following Him. He says this, he used this illustration, he says, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos, all tuned to the same tuning fork, are automatically tuned to each other? But to another standard, oh, sorry, they are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than any other could possibly be. Were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship, they could not be closer. Unity comes as we fix our eyes on him. If you were to imagine uh, the church as an orchestra playing, uh, what kind of sound would we, the players, the conductor that leads us, and the world that is our audience listening to us, what kind of sound would the world hear from the church right now in this moment? Would it be a, would it be a pleasing sound? Go like this. No, it would not. It would not be a pleasing sound. Uh, if you look at what's happening on social media, the church is, is blowing itself apart. We are not demonstrating uh, beauty, beauty at all. What would, what would that concert that's supposed to be a service of worship, what could it be like? Could it be in tune? Uh, well, I believe like dialogue and debate and discussion and interaction is important. Uh, the only thing that can truly bring us back together is if we as individual people learn to tune our spiritual instruments, to tune our hearts uh, to the one tone that's being emitted uh, by the Father, to begin to play music that our Heavenly Father has written on the page. Uh, to begin to submit to the fixed standard of his baton, rhythmically moving up and down. That's the only way to avoid uh, the discard and the noise that we're hearing. If we have any hope of offering a unified, um, relevant witness to the world, it's absolutely essential uh, that we begin to fix our eyes on Jesus and begin to turn our hearts to him. I believe every Christian has to take their eyes off of YouTube and Facebook uh, and fix their eyes on Jesus. 
Um, so just a question for you. Is that, is that something you're experiencing? Are you experiencing, even in your personal life, when you think about the church and you think about people in the church, are you experiencing sort of a sense of well-being? Are you experiencing a sense of harmony, a sense of belonging? Or are you feeling in the back of your mind, in the back of your heart, a little sense of fear, a little sense of anxiety, a little sense of what does that person think? I don't know what I think about them. Is there anxiousness in your heart when you think about the church and where it's at? Uh, our text today, I think, is going to teach us uh, really simply um, how to tune our hearts to that one voice, how to tune our hearts to that uh, song of the Spirit that God is singing uh, over us. We want to look at what it means uh, to, to enter into that. So the first thing uh, we want to look at is that first um, text, that first part of the verse, um, and we'll go back to uh, chapter 3 in a moment, but start at the beginning of chapter uh, 4. It says this, they, for, I therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Um, first off, Paul's a prisoner in the Lord at this point. To just look at that text and look at where it fits in the story, Paul's writing the book of Ephesians or the letter to the church of Ephesians from Rome, and he's a prisoner at this point. He's in Rome. He's close to the end of his life. He knows that it's likely that he is going to die in that place. He's under house arrest, we understand. And what Paul is doing in these last days of his life is sort of passionately writing these letters uh, to churches that he's planted, to people that he loves, people that he cares about, and saying, hey, I really, uh, this is like my final message to you. I really want you to get it. I really want you to know. I really want you to connect with this stuff that I'm laying down. This is something that's really important to him. And what he's saying to them is, hey, I want you uh, to walk in gentleness with one another. I want you to walk in humility towards one another. I want you to be eager to maintain this unity uh, in the spirit, this bond of peace. And I think if I, if I were to ask you, does anybody here want this unity? Does anybody really want to be outside of a bond of peace? I mean, that's something we all want, but, but, but how does Paul frame it so that we can understand like, how we're supposed to get there? How are we supposed to get to unity? What is it that unites us? What is he saying in the text about what brings us uh, together? And he uses this phrase, um, walk in a way that is worthy of the calling to which you're called. Now, when Paul repeats something in the scriptures, repeats two words, that word calling we're noticing. Uh, you know, Paul's a verbose guy, and he, he, he strings sentences together. He, he doesn't tend to repeat himself unless he really wants you to get it. What he's sort of saying here is, hey, you know that calling? You know, like the one to which you were called? Like he's like getting our attention here. He's wanting us to understand um, that uh, in order to follow him, in order to do this unity thing, in order to do this humility thing, there's something that we do it out of. We do it out of a sense of calling. And Paul's idea for calling is, is pretty different from ours. Uh, for Paul, um, that mission that he is on is not the mission that he chose. That calling, and, and the Greek word here is really interesting. The Greek word doesn't mean uh, like, hey, come over here, please. Calling all sheep, come on in, come follow me. The word calling here, it means to be summoned. It's a calling with authority. So if you think uh, about your life and you think about what you mean when you think about calling, uh, when we think about calling, we think it's something we're sort of invited into. What Paul is talking about in terms of calling is something that you're demanded into a little bit more. It's something that's a little more serious. There's a nuance there. Um, and for us in our culture, we have even have a weaker idea of calling, don't we? For you and I, when we think of calling, we think calling is to sort of take that thing that we think we're good at, sort of identify our personality. We do. How many of you have done a personality test even in the last year? Right? Tons of us have. How many of you know your Enneagram number? Uh, we do all kinds of different sort of things to determine what it is that we like, uh, determine who we are, and then decide who it is, what it is that we want to do. 
And that thing that we've decided that we are and the thing that we've decided we want to do, we very often say that that's our calling. It's a very self-oriented idea of a calling, isn't it? It's very internal. It's very us Focused. In fact, using that word calling for what Paul is talking about, uh, for what the, in terms of the way we talk about it, is it's totally illogical, right? You can't call yourself to something or people just think you're crazy. Hey, Aaron, why don't you go over there? Hey, you know, maybe I can send myself a Facebook, uh, uh, make myself a Facebook group and set myself up a, a Facebook events every time I want to do something. Or maybe I could put in a Google Calendar notice and invite myself to things and I can click yes, maybe, or no if I'm deciding to go. Right, so you can't decide to call yourself to something. Uh, it's a logical calling is something that comes uh, from outside. And Paul's understanding from his story is completely different. He was a guy who knew his life. He knew what he was going to do. He knew what he was about. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? He was uh, uh, a leader among a group of people who were performing a function in society. He had studied all his life to get there. He was well recognized. Uh, He was recognized in uh, Acts chapter 9 for being the person who was, you know, pouring out the most murderous threats against Christians and doing his very best to persecute them. And he was getting the pat on the back for it. That was that was what Paul felt like his calling was until Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, shined a bright light, said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And literally knocked him on his butt and struck him blind in Acts chapter 9. And this is what Jesus said to Paul when Jesus redirected Paul's sense of calling. He said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. That sounds like a little bit different than me spending time in the Enneagram and trying to figure out my vocation. Paul has a very different idea about what the calling is. So when he responded to the call of Jesus, he found that walking in a way that was worthy of that call demanded that uh, he was listening to something outside himself, and that demand to listen to that thing outside himself caused him to know that he had to live in a way that was good relative to those other than himself. He knew that if he was following someone who was other than himself, he had to live in a way that was different uh, and live in a way that was good relative to others. Uh, Living with all humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, that was how his master lived. And so that was how he had to live. And if we want to live in a way that is worthy of the master who's called us, We have to live like the master who's called us. We can't live worthy of the master who's called us and act differently from the master who's called us. And so we look to the life of Jesus and how he lived and flowing out of that love and adoration for him, that sense of him, this other person who is calling us forward in the journey, we need to be people who imitate. Uh, Going back to our orchestra, um, imagine that you're a music- musician, you've just been recruited, you know, out of college, and you've, you've, you've gotten this amazing opportunity to play for the National Arts Center Orchestra. You had this amazing opportunity. You're, you're green, you don't, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you've, you know, played in classes, you've maybe met some of these people, but the conductor has called you up and said, hey, we li- listen, we need somebody to fill in, we need you to join the band, we need you to play with us. We have a big concert coming up, can you, can you play? Now, that call from that conductor and knowing that you're on the schedule to play in that orchestra, that's going to change the way you practice. That's going to change the whole deal. That's going to call you to a higher standard. That's going to call you to a different way. So a question for us. Uh, when was the last time we went to Instagram or YouTube or, or searching for something to learn? When the question wasn't, what can I learn here about what I want to do? What can I learn here about myself? What can I learn here that makes me happy? What can I learn here that might give me joy? What can I gather here that will entertain me? 
what if we went to a different source, maybe, maybe we could try the scriptures, crazy idea, and we asked the question, not what am I interested in, but what is the scripture's interest in me? What does Jesus want out of me? What does he call me to in this? Can I hear echoes of what Paul heard from Jesus? Now get up. Go where you're going. Go into the city. Go to your job. Go to your school. Go to your workplace. And you'll be told what you must do. I think if we go into the word um, passionately wanting to know our marching orders, not with our preconceived agendas, we're going to find, uh, surprisingly, that we're going to be going in the same direction as our brothers and sisters in Christ, because God is calling us all to the same place. The second uh, idea in the text, and, and I'm going to read it for, for us in just a second here, uh, comes from this idea, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, summoned to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul's idea of unity is that it flows from some simple, basic truths that he is designed, that are uh, in the nature of the universe, uh, that he is wanting us to know about, and that those things, those truths that we unite ourselves around, uh, are the things that also bring us together. Uh, in, in the next, those three verses uh, where, we, where, where that text just reads, you know, one spirit, uh, one body, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. If you extract out all the words in between, you have seven, uh, do it with my fingers, seven number ones, right? There are seven items there. There are seven ones in that text. Seven's an important number in the scriptures, right? Seven is a number of completeness. Seven is a number of wholeness. Seven is a number uh, of, of, of blessing. And in that, we see um, what, what, is, what is actually amazingly a, a really early uh, formulation of one of the creeds, right? And, it, and it's in order like the creeds. Uh, I wish I had it on the screen for you. Um, I'll read it again. Um, we were called to the one, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One body. Um, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of us all. And it's the creeds built from the end to the beginning, and, and he's building uh, back to the foundation. But when we see the creeds emerge a little bit later in church history, uh, they're mostly built from the beginning uh, through to the end. So we read it backwards, we have one God. And we'll also see, that you can also see that this is actually the structure of the book of Romans, Paul's apologetic section in the book of Romans. Uh, so he, he, he takes these seven elements and crafts them together. One God, recognize your creator. And we hear it in the Apostles' Creed. Creed, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. One baptism. But we all come into the faith, understanding that we need to repent and to be baptized. Our, our coming into the faith comes with an acknowledgement of our sin. One faith. We have faith through uh, Jesus Christ, our salvation on the cross, that he died for us and he forgives us and he took away our sin. That's where our faith is placed in his, in his work on the cross. One Lord, the resurrected Christ, has proven his lordship. He is Christus Victor. He has risen from the grave and he has conquered death and he is Lord over all. One hope, he has ascended to the Father and he will soon return. He's ascended to the right hand of God. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Reflected in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, there's the gift of one spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit that we saw who came in the book of Acts. Who unites us. Who calls us to him. Who is our teacher. Who is our guide. Who is a giver of gifts. Who empowers us to do the work of the kingdom. And then one body. We have one community that we live in. 
and none of us can say that this hand is no good while this hand is good. None of us can say I'm going to chop off my foot because I don't like it anymore. We have one body, one community that we're part of. If you take these elements of the story, stated simply, these ideas are plenty. These ideas are enough to unite us and to bring us together and for us to focus on without us searching for wild things on social media and on YouTube. There's enough depth for us to dig in here to transform us and to change us and make us new. If you look at that first one, one God, the recognition of your creator, uh, that idea and all of these ideas, they're not just like historical things to lay a hold of. And, and hey, that was an old traditional church thing. Uh, I remember that phrase from the Apostles' Creed. I kind of believe that. I'm going to check that box. These aren't just historical ideas that we're sort of holding on to doctrinally and hoping like heck that the church doesn't change. These ideas are ideas that are forward thinking. These are ideas that are transformative. These are future shaping realities that given in the time of Christ have shaped the world from then to now and in this space and time are meant to shape your life and shape the world around us from this moment forward. These are future shaping realities. If you live knowing one God as a monotheist, if you live recognizing that there's one God and one creator of all, uh, that is going to radically change your moral life. That is going to radically change uh, what you believe about uh, how you live relative to other humans. That's going to be radically different than someone who at the core of their being and the core of their beliefs uh, believes in natural selection. That the strongest survive. And that the weak should be called out of the gene pool. <laughs> right? If you believe that there is one God who is the creator of all, it's going to change the way you live. It's going to change the way you think. It's going to change the way you're a steward of creation around you. If you believe that repentance is a necessary part of your journey, that you need to repent and be baptized, to turn away from your sin and begin to follow Jesus, that's going to radically shape your journey through the world. Uh, we live in a context of, of a world that doesn't believe in sin, that doesn't believe that there is wrong, that doesn't believe that there's anything to repent from. We can't get better from that place. The world can't get to be a better place unless we recognize the existence of sin and our need to repent and our need to have it forgiven. These ideas that we hold on to are radical, future-shaping ideas. And we need to hang on to them. We need to meditate on them. If you meditate on them and believe on them and, and act radically on them, you're going to find that there's enough transformative work to do that will probably distract you from some of the stuff that makes you scratch your head on Facebook or Twitter, <laughs> right? There is something powerful in these. Listen, I remember I was talking to uh, my, my band teacher, Mr. Mills, when I was a kid in school. Um, I was uh, a musical guy. We're, we're, we're in all in, we haven't got a single sports metaphor today. Um, we are all uh, doing music today. Uh, but I remember my band teacher in school, uh, Mr. Mills, a uh, wonderful guy, kind of drove me bonkers. I kind of drove him bonkers. Um, but I was uh, a guy who... I, I was kind of bored in music class. Like I, I had a sort of a natural ear. I could play by ear a little bit. And I would just sometimes in music class just do my own thing. We would be playing. I'd have the score out in front of me. Sometimes I wouldn't have the music open. But there were notes that were just long notes that were just, I found them boring. I just found them boring. And so it'd be a note that'd be telling them, la, and I'd be like, that's boring. I'll do la, 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 and I would just play it, a saxophone, I'm a nerd, what can I say? Um, and one day he just sort of pulled me aside. <laughs> he said, you know, I know that you can hear a lot of notes in that one note, and you can play them, and you can do a unique thing, and you can do an interesting thing, but that's not what the composer of the score wanted you to play. You have to think about how that affects the music that's being heard by 
myself, by the audience. But even more than that, that one note played for a whole bar. There is more in that one note and more to keep you interested than you can find in the five notes. There's the attack. How you start that note. Is it da, 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 da? Is it, what, is it is, how do you start it? Is it a ta, is it a da, is it a ma? How does that note start? Does that note have a curve to it? Does that note have a crescendo and a decrescendo? Does it have vibrato? Does it have a difference in tone? Is something that is beautiful to be seen in the note that you don't understand unless you play it and hold it and listen to it? And how does that note end and take you into the note that follows? A, a musician who learns how to play the one note, to play the long note and to play it well, that ability to play that one note well and to hear everything that's happening inside of it will inform the way you later get the chance to play the fast notes. And that's what it's like, I think, for many of us as we, as we look at everything that's going on. We have all kinds of people in our culture um, who are maybe even sort of trying to play the same song. Maybe we're all playing within the realm of Christianity. But we're taking notes that were meant to be sustained and beautiful and bold and strong and to be heard powerfully and beautifully. And we're playing them in ways to jazz them up and make them more fun for ourselves. And we're missing the power and the beauty and the breadth of the central truths that God has called us to. It's so easy for us to find interests um, beyond the core of what Christianity is. To be distracted by one ideology or one thought or one a small theology within the theme of the whole. But I believe that if we take some of the time that we spend playing our own tune and invested in playing in harmony with one another, getting everything that we can out of the big notes, every other part of the music will be more beautiful. Uh, in music itself, in any scale within sort of a Western musical framework, within the basics of what music is, what is most common to us, what we would hear in movie scores and in traditional music. There are a myriad of ways to play a song, but there are ultimately, just like in this text, just seven notes. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and back to C. If you're finished, they have an H. Um, but here uh, we have just those seven notes. When we become one, like interested in the beauty at the core of what Christianity is, that will inform all of the rest of our questions. If we are looking at uh, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who was slain before the foundations of the world and looking at the story of the cross, we will understand the rider on the white horse in Revelation better. We'll understand the Lamb seated on the throne. We need to understand the core. Uh, the third uh, idea I have here is we kind of zoom out just a little bit, um, starts with uh, the, the verses preceding chapter four in, in chapter three. It says this, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. I therefore, a prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. All that we've just read about unity fits underneath a therefore. There's a why, there's a because. Unity is not an end in itself. Unity is not a goal in itself. As we talked about with the illustration at the beginning, uh, if we tune 100 pianos to the same fork, they'll be in tune. It's the fork that's important in this case. To him be glory 
in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. It's not about us. It's not about us having a more peaceful uh, Christian experience. It's not about us having a more harmonious club. It's not about us feeling heard or belonging or having a voice. Uh, it's not about our achievement or creating something that gives us that awesome sense of togetherness. Those are all okay things. But from Paul's understanding of the why of unity is it's all about him. It's all for him. It's all for his glory. The beginning of unity is worship. The beginning of unity is worship. Uh, let's go back to the band. It's a very different thing playing in rehearsal than it is playing before an audience. And in this case, we have an audience. And it's an audience of one. The music is for him. The music is to him. The music is about him. And we, when we sing the music of our hearts, when we study theology, when we read the word, when we do anything, if it is for him, to him, about him, we see everything that we encounter in a completely different way. It's completely different to play for an audience of one than it is to play for yourself. So I wonder if when we're chasing uh, different ideas and different thoughts and different specialties and different interests, what if when we were doing that, we were asking ourselves, is this drawing me to him? Am I seeing his glory? Am I seeing his beauty? Or am I seeing something that gives me glory? Or something that makes me feel more beautiful? or something that makes me like myself more, love myself more, whatever it is. Am I going into everything that I'm consuming with a heart of worship or with a heart that is for myself? If you worship Jesus seeking to glorify him as passionately in our study and in our seeking as we do in our song, we will have a very different experience and we will find ourselves studying and seeking alongside our brothers and sisters. There's an amazing story, just to conclude, uh, from World War II. Um, in um, Europe, wherever he had power and control, uh, Hitler commanded all of religious groups to kind of unify and just sort of present themselves to one another uh, just as, as one structure. Unity seems like a good thing, but it doesn't work when it's enforced like that. But anyway, the end result of it is in a number of different churches, a number of different denominations and Christian communities. Some part of the community said, yes, we will, we will join the state church. And some believers said, no, we, we won't join the state church. And it was an incredibly painful uh, space um, for the church in that time uh, through the Second World War. Um, after the war was over, um, there were obviously feelings of bitterness and anger and resentment. Uh, and one story is in particular of the, of the Brethren community in Germany. And they were deeply divided when the war was over. Um, they were deeply angry with one another, uh, with those who had capitulated and those who had maintained independence. They, they didn't know how they could ever come back together. Francis Schaeffer tells this story having talked to one of the survivors. And he says, so, so what did you do? How did you fix it? Because you're, you're one now. Francis Schaeffer looking at the community and said, no, you're united now, but you were in such pain and so divided back then. How, how did that happen? And uh, what the man described was, well, you know, we, we, we simply gathered. And we gathered for, for a number of days and, and we, we didn't talk. We gathered in our separate rooms, we gathered maybe over meals, but the goal was for us not to have conversation, but to simply be in the same place and to pray. And then Francis Schaeffer asked, so, so what did you do then? What, was, what, what happened next? What was the conversation about? How did you reconcile? And the brethren leader that he was spoken to 
He said, none of us know. None of us know what happened. All we know is that we prayed for three days. And then we were one. We become one with our eyes fixed on him. We become one with our hearts oriented around what we are to believe as people. We become one when we worship. We can only become one when we see that he is one. That's our call. That's how we protect ourselves. That's how we stay one body. James, you can come with the worship team.